kind of living in the golden age of sports cars where 400 horsepower in the brand new Nissan Z sounds like a lot, and it is. But if you're like me, it's not enough and you're gonna wanna mod it. One of the big differences between the new Z and the 370Z, of course, is the engine. It's the V6 twin turbo, the VR30 DDTT. And because it's a turbo, it's gonna be a lot easier to get power out of it. So let's talk about the five things that you need to do to get additional power out of it. I confirmed with Nissan that the VR30 engine is exactly the same one used in the Q50 probably even got the same ECU. It's a direct transplant. So we should be able to take the lessons that have been learned from the Q50 and apply them directly to the Z. And so with that in mind, I've done a bit of research and I've discovered what people are commonly doing to make about 450 horsepower or a little bit more. I just drove the new Nissan Z and I compared it to my Supra and I've got some more clarified thoughts I wanna share with you a little bit later in this video. So an engine of course is basically just a big air pump. We get air in the front, we add fuel at the cylinder, we combust it, that makes a bunch of power and torque, and it goes out the back as exhaust. So we want to basically free up that flow so we're getting more air in so we can burn more fuel and get the exhaust out faster. So let's start at the front of the car with the intakes. So most people are going to add an intake to their vehicle. And remember, all this kind of works as a system because if you've got a bottleneck in the system, that is going to restrict your power. So you want to have the air coming in, combust it and get it out as quickly as possible. So you sort of need to do all these things in order to get good power. So a lot of people have been using AMS intakes, which I can say is a pretty good brand. I know people have been using it on their Supra. And of course, it's a V6, you've got two intakes and that's gonna add a little bit to the cost of the thing. And then you wanna get the exhaust out more quickly. So the most important thing you can probably do is use a downpipe or actually two downpipes in the case of the VR30 engine, because of course it's a V6. Now, as I understand it, there are four cats along these two pipes. You've got a primary cat and a secondary cat. And as I understand it, there's two kinds of downpipes you can get, one that just remove one of the cat, one that removes both of the cats. Of course, these are both for off-road use only, so I'm just talking about hypotheticals here. But once you've got the air in through the intakes, it's combusted, you're getting it out with these downpipes, that's going to free up your exhaust. It's basically gonna increase the exhaust velocity that you're getting, and you're not gonna have that blockage of the catalytic converters. And then another thing you can do, of course, is add an exhaust in as well to further free up the, uh, the airflow. Now, I don't know how restrictive the exhaust is going to be on the new Z. I haven't seen any tests on it. I don't think any really, anybody really has one in their hands yet, but we're gonna find out pretty soon. And there's one thing to note, there is a difference between the automatic and the manual Z, and that has to do with the amount of noise that it generates. Good power but it is a pretty good sounding engine. So now that you got these basic things in place, what you wanna do is tie it all together with a tune. The way the ECU is tuned from the factory is designed to work with stock parameters and produce stock power and stock emissions. The goal in getting more power, of course, is to be able to burn a little bit more fuel to create more power. So you need to alter the programming in order to take advantage of these hardware modifications that you've done. And there's two basic kinds of tunes. There is a piggyback style tune, and then there is a flash tune. So let's talk about what a piggyback tune is first. That is essentially a little device that is going to plug into your wiring harness. And what it's gonna do is it's going to intercept various signals coming from the engine, and it's going to alter those signals before sending them back to the ECU. So you're essentially fooling the engine into making more power by uh, doing things like producing more boost pressure, advancing the spark, and so forth. And I'm not a tuner, so I can't really speak to the specifics of these kinds of things. But when you've got a, a, a tune like that, you're gonna have some kind of limitations. You're not gonna be able to do a lot of custom tuning, and you're not gonna be able to take full advantage of the hardware that you have. But it is going to be less expensive, and these are kind of off-the-shelf things. And typically, you can get it shipped to you in a day or two, plug it in, start going, and a lot of people are gonna be pretty happy with the type of power they're making from that. And in fact, you can just do a flash tune alone with no hardware modifications at all without adding anything to the car. And generally speaking, you're gonna make a little bit more power for next to nothing. 
The second main kind of tune is something called a flash tune. And that is where you actually alter the programming of the ECU. So you're changing the values in the actual computer itself, the ECU that controls your vehicle. And so this is a little bit more desirable because you're gonna be able to work with a tuner to get a customized tune that's gonna be specific to the bolt-ons that you added. You're gonna have just a lot more ability to customize things. You're gonna have a lot more ability to make things exactly the way you want and typically produce a little bit more power too. Now this is gonna be more expensive to do, but I have verified that in fact you can tune the VR30 platform with at least something called Ecutech. They're a British company. Again, this video is not sponsored and you will need to, generally speaking, work with a tuner that has purchased the Ecutech product and work with them to get a tune loaded onto your vehicle and get it set up exactly the way you want. Now with a flash tune, you're typically gonna have a couple of different tunes that you can switch between using your phone and perhaps also some other parameters too. For example, on this, you would be able to change the amount of burble. These tunes, you can also update them over the air. And typically you're gonna work with a tuner and they can send you a tune that you're gonna load up using your personal laptop. So we talked about four things so far. We talked about the air intakes, we've talked about a downpipe, we've talked about an exhaust, and we talked about a tune. Now there's a fifth thing that you can do which is going to make the overall system work a little bit better, and that is to swap out the heat exchanger, which is up front. And the heat exchanger is going to take heat out of the system. It's a heat exchanger. And in order to reduce the overall temperature of the entire system and make the car a little bit more stable, especially in hot weather or if you're doing pulls, you can upgrade that heat exchanger. So again, I verified with Nissan that this does have essentially the same heat exchanger that it does on the Q50. So it's a pretty small heat exchanger on that vehicle. And I looked at it on the Z. And so if you upgrade that, again, using something like AMS, there's probably a bunch of other manufacturers too, you're gonna to be able to reduce the overall system heat, which is gonna be beneficial to making power. So doing all those things should give you somewhere in the range of 400 to 500 horsepower, I believe. It's gonna cost you a couple of grand in parts, and of course, there's gonna be some labor to install it. Now, if you wanna go much bigger power, you're gonna to have to upgrade your turbos, and someone like Pure, They've got systems which I think start at around $3,600 and go to about $4,500, $4,800 for a pair of turbos. You can need two of them, of course. Then you can start making some much bigger power by doing that. And of course, at that point, you're probably going to want to upgrade a whole bunch of other things too when you sort of get into a cascade of pretty expensive mods. So that's definitely one way to go. But let's talk about for a second my thoughts on the Supra versus the Z because the last video, which I'm going to link down here where I compared them, drove them back to back. In fact, I was the first one. That video generated a lot of comments. So first up, you need to understand that I shot that video with Nissan's vehicle. They were very generous to lend me the car. They allowed me to drive the car. They invited me down to do that in San Diego. And I actually sprung the comparison on them at the last minute. So thank you very much, Nissan, for letting me actually do the car comparison. So with that said, I want to clarify some of my thoughts on the vehicle. So one of the big comments that I got was that I was biased because I was comparing a $40,000 vehicle against a $50,000, $52,000 vehicle, but I actually stand by my point that I think the Z for $40,000 still wins because you can't get the Supra at $40,000. For $44,000, you get the two liter, which is kind of weak sauce compared to what you get in the Z. So was it a perfect comparison? Absolutely not. But again, I stand by my point, $40,000 is a huge value and I think the car really speaks to a lot of enthusiasts. They're gonna sell a lot more Zs than they are Supras. They've sold these in the tens of thousands in terms of the entire Z production from the 240 starting in 1969 up until now. They've sold, I think, about 1.3 million. So it is a much more popular car on balance. The Supra has always been a more expensive vehicle. So it's sort of the position of it is you've got cars that are around the $30,000 level. You've got the Miata, then you've got the BRZ GR86 twins, then you've got the, the Z and the Supra kind of in the middle, and above that you've got the Corvette. So that's kind of where it's place is. There are two competing cars for the money which have more power for less money and of course that is the Camaro with the ZL1 package with the V8 and also the Mustang GT. 
So the entry point is $40,000 for the Sport, and that has cloth seats, doesn't have the leather interior. So the next step up is the performance version, and you get a couple of significant things in the performance department for that. Namely, you get a limited slip differential, and you get a much bigger brakes front and rear, but you do get the same engine. It's going up $10,000, and I don't think that's as good a value, nearly, as $40,000, obviously, because to get into a 2022 Supra, the premium, the 3.0, not the premium, just the 3.0, starts at about $51,000, $52,000. So we're talking about just now a $2,000 difference between the two cars. So it's not as good a value when you get up to that $50,000 level. Let me just put that out there. And another thing I want to talk about is the weight difference between these two vehicles. So the Z comes in at 35 to 3,600 pounds, roughly, depending on trim. You can expect the performance automatic is going to be about 3,600. Toyota quotes this at 3,400, but I know from weighing the vehicle with a quarter tank, it weighs just a little over 33, like 3,325. So there is a pretty significant weight difference. We're talking about almost 300 pounds, probably in real life until someone weighs the Z, maybe it does weigh less than 3,600, but that's what we know right now. Two to 300 pounds is pretty significant. Now, I also drove the manual transmission, and of course, there is no manual for this, and that kind of sucks at launch, and obviously, Toyota has seen what's going on and decided to come out with the manual transmission, but this has the ZF8HP transmission, which is the most popular transmission in the world, as I understand it, and this thing can handle a ton of torque. I don't know what the Z transmission drives like. I wasn't able to drive the automatic version, so that wasn't really a fair comparison from a back-to-back -back perspective. Also, a couple other things with this vehicle compared to that one. This obviously has aftermarket wheels and tires on there. That wasn't much of a factor because I wasn't really able to do a lot of performance driving. I think the Z is a little bit more of a grand tour, a little bit more laid back. This is a little bit more knife edge, I guess you could say. This is a little bit more of that samurai sword ready to slice and dice the roads. Now, this has a more refined overall feel. I think the materials in the cabin are better. The cabin is much tighter. The Z feels more airy, definitely, but this has a much stiffer body structure. This car feels a lot more structurally kind of sound. And also, there's a lot more storage space in the back of the car, too. So it wasn't the perfect comparison. Yeah, this is a 2020 compared to a 2023. This has, for that test, I tuned this to 2022 horsepower levels, which is 382 horsepower, but my butt dyno tells me that this car is actually quicker. And I just want to point out how strange the internet is when in 2019 BMW was such a dirty word with this car, because yeah, this is almost entirely BMW components. In fact, it's built in Graz, Austria. The Z is obviously Japanese and it's built in Japan, but somehow that all got thrown out the window with the Z comparison. Now people say that BMW isn't such a bad thing, so the internet is kind of a weird place. And there's obviously a lot more mods that you can do to your Z, such as wheels and tires, spring suspension, body kits. It all really depends on how you want to customize your Z, and I know people are going to go nuts and start doing that, and that is super awesome. I hope that Nissan sells a ton of these things. And if you want to see my back-to-back -back comparison, it was the very first one. Click right over here. Thanks for watching.